Hey guys, how's it going? Michael Troy here, and today we're going to be looking at The Dark Phoenix Saga from The Uncanny X-Men by John Byrne, Chris Claremont, and Terry Austin. Alright, so here's this, I don't know what when, how old this trade paperback is, but um, I have the original trade paperback of The Dark Phoenix Saga with the cool Bill Sienkiewicz painting that I'm sure you're familiar with if you are a, a hardcore X-Men John Byrne fan like I am. So this is, of course, uh, you know, touted as one of the best comics in history, and it's um, deservedly so. I mean, it was totally groundbreaking. This art is just amazing. You have John Byrne on pencils, Terry Austin on inks, Glynis um, uh, Ween on colors, and Bob Sharon, Tom Orzechowski, Orzechowski, the famous legendary X letterer. <laughs> so this is just a fun reprint. I remember uh, this is one of the earlier burn issues that I got because when I came on to X Men, it was after he had already left, so I had to kind of rediscover discover him retroactively like that. But I mean, this is so great. I love the Blackbird on the runway and the runway slick with water, and you can see the reflection and. Just the body language of all the characters is so cool. I always love this cover. Um, this is the introduction of Kitty Pride, so it's a very special issue. The character who would go on to become probably one of the most beloved X characters. See, it's just fun like that. I love the X-Men just sitting there on the plane on the way home, and they all have their own little body language and their own thing going on. I mean... John Byrne definitely takes advantage of the, you know, the medium and the, that's why he's one of the great comic book storytellers, you know, all his characters act appropriately, he, all his settings are on point, he doesn't skimp on details, you know, he doesn't sacrifice story for Flash, I mean, but then when you get the Flash, it's, it's worth the payoff, and, you know, this is one, two, three, this is like five panels here, and you get a great like panel like that as one of them with featuring basically the whole team. So this is them returning. I think, I don't know where they were before, but it doesn't matter. They're there in the danger room. It's funny. I don't know if they still use the danger room or not, but it always seemed like a, a weird concept to me. Um, I mean, talk about trial by fire, eh? And here's the introduction to Kitty Pride. Um, John Byrne infamously based her look on, I believe it was someone, or his neighbor, um, and she had a little, uh, she wasn't Jewish, but she wore a Jew star of David necklace for her, for her boyfriend was Jewish. And so that's how Kitty Pride became Jewish. I said that was so cool when um, she fell asleep with a headache and woke up on the living room floor, like, what the heck, how did I get here? I wanted to be a mutant so bad. I mean, I probably was one uh, socially anyway, but, you know, <clears throat> throw in some great powers at the same time and way to sweeten the pot. This is such a great panel. There's so much going on here. Once again, I mean, this, this we're only like, you know, not even halfway through the first issue and there's just so much, so many takeaways, like so much goodness, comic book goodness, like, I just have to point out, so they're in the they're in the soda shop while uh, Xavier talks to Kitty's parents, and there's a suspicious looking soda jerk looking like a creep, and there's the spot mirror you can see in the corner, soda dollar twenty five, and there's just like his little extra people, and there's like a rip in the booth with tape over it. It's just that kind of attention to detail that makes you just sink into a a John Byrne story and. Um, live in it and then uh, Wolverine looking at the dirty magazines with naive Peter looking over his shoulder oh poor Petey anyway Kitty looks so cute there and Storm looks so beautiful John Byrne draws my favorite Storm he draws my favorite everything let's face it so but um of course they can't even have a soda without uh you know getting attacked by these robots and uh, kidnapped by the Hellfire Club I always like these kind of effects that Burn would do. And there's the White Queen. When she was just evil and just a bad guy as she should be. Oh my gosh. And then 
one issue later, right after Kitty, we have the introduction of Dazzler. I mean, this is like a banner trade paperback right here. That's a great logo here. And once again, we have such a great shot of like the city street and I don't know, such a, you know, the angles that burn picks and he's never afraid of like a perspective. There's never anything, well, I shouldn't say that, never anything. So this infamously is a burn working joker into the crowd. Um, funny, but I guess uh, the pierced nose uh, is enough to make him not look like the joker. It's funny because that could, that could feasibly be like a, a weird version of Harley Quinn, don't you think? Sebastian Shaw, I think burn based him on Robert Shaw. Um, the actor from Jaws. And Kitty's Bell Bottoms. Gotta love her Bell Bottoms. There's Storm in the cage, all woozy. See, even messed up, she can still pull it together, together enough to rip out her. I mean, this is, this always struck me as a little strange that uh, she just kept Professor Xavier's phone number and that little ring that was in her costume <laughs> oh here comes a good part too so jean started tripping out in this club maybe somebody slipped something in her drink <laughs> because why else would she hallucinate that she's in this bondage gear and then start making out with a stranger oh my gosh how awful scott seems pretty chill about it but you know saved by the dazzler they are about to introduce dazzler so such a great shot there and there she is and it's funny because uh John Byrne hates Dazzler so much, and um, but he still nailed it. She still looks great, so ha ha, John Byrne. <laughs> Thank you for Dazzler. I don't think he designed her, but he introduced us to her, so we'll always have that. So there's uh, Jason Wingard lighting a cigarette, and in the shadow, you can see it's Mastermind's shadow, which is so cool. Such a great... You know, that's why comic books just rock. I love this here. This is another great page with uh, Kitty on the run and the X-Men headshots. I like when they do this sort of a roll call, the dramatis personae, if you will. And my bad uh, Ohio Latin there. So I thought that, I always like that too. She just rearranges the molecules in her costume telekinetically to put on her street clothes. John Byrne famously based a lot of his uh, characters on real people, just as a point of reference, not like his direct copies. And um, Jean was Raquel Welch. That's a little strange with a 13 year old's boobs in your face, but hey, it was the 80s. It was actually like 1980, I think, to be exact. So that's why we still have uh, Disco trying to come in on the heels of already being declared dead. But as long as there's Dazzler, Disco will never be dead. And she's like, hell no, I'm not joining the X-Men. <laughs> it's so weird because uh, uh, nobody turns down being in the X-Men, right? That was uh, my friend Matt just uh, did this blog about the blob uh, being invited to join the X-Men way back in X-Men number three. And they were all offended because he didn't want to join. So that kind of reminded me of that. But oh, and see, and that's funny, too, because also Xavier, um, oh, Kitty's dad is like, hell no, she's not joining the X-Men. And then suddenly she ch he changes his mind and Scott's like, oh, my God, you don't think that. Professor X would do that. And she's like, no, but I would. <clears throat> so that's kind of funny. I guess that's foreshadowing. To the, As we know, this is not really Jean Grey. Jean Grey is asleep at the bottom of Jamaica Bay while this uh, Phoenix uh, slash Jean Grey impersonator runs around causing havoc, making out with uh, guys on clubs and on the beach and crap like that. Here comes Angel with his uh, super preppy outfit and his uh, headband and wristbands and tube socks. That's so awesome. I love that. 
I mean, young kids best just laugh when they see stuff like that, but to me, it's a, it's a fun memory. <laughs> anyway, so, see, she just got way too powerful. So they're about to make out, and everybody knows. It's funny, because in that issue of the X-Men, Scott was saying how he was in love with Jean, but he couldn't do anything about it because uh, of his power. And here she is. Uh, hey, no big whoop. I'll just hold your... Um, your optic beams back with my telekinesis while we make out. No big deal. Hopefully I don't get too excited and lose my concentration. I wouldn't want you to blow my head off or something like that, right? God, Terry Austin is such a good anchor. I just love the art on this. I could look at the art on this all day. That's why I'm taking forever so you guys can just drink this in too. I mean, if you have never read the Dark Phoenix Saga, do yourself a favor and read it and if you have read it and it's ingrained in your brain like it is all of ours all of us hardcore x-men burn fans read it again i just like the textures and stuff i'm pretty sure i mean i could be wrong because john does add a tremendous amount of detail in his pencils but terry was always famous for like you know adding textures and stuff like this carpet is probably his addition and maybe the shadow on this wall here um, Orson Welles is Harry Leland, maybe. There goes Wolverine. Um, he's increasing his mass so much because that's what he can do because he's fat, I guess. Um, so he gets super heavy and falls down to the sewer and we know what's coming. Okay. Or we, if you don't, then it's going to be exciting. But I always, I don't know, maybe it's a, a sign of the times, but I don't, I hate seeing women get beat up in college. <laughs> I know that's terrible, but Storm could kick Shaw's ass easily, I'm sure. But there the X-Men are defeated. It's always so sad when they're defeated. And there's Jean, her full um, transformation into the Black Queen under the influence of Mastermind. And there's like one of the most famous panels in comics ever. So good, so cool, like so, like badass like there's Wolverine and he's he's in a sewer and he's dirty and he's pissed off and he's gonna take no prisoners and boy does he not take any prisoners I think John Byrne really liked him being a homicidal maniac and <laughs> I don't know if they I don't think they can do this anymore can they what's the point of having claws if you can't use them like that but does Wolverine still go around killing people I suppose he would, but that isn't very, you know, moral. I mean, I don't know how the X-Men could just keep putting up with that. Moira McTaggart and her lover, the sexy Banshee, Sean Cassidy. I love the Hellfire Club so sleazy. I think there was a, a real Hellfire Club in New York. Like, that was like a sex club that may have been the influence for this, which is kind of, I mean, obvious with the bondage gear and all that stuff, but it's like, clearly, I don't know with the, you know, who are these written for? <laughs> I mean, you know, like, do 10, I mean, I was probably super young when I read these stories, so I don't know, but... You don't really think of crap like that when you're just wanting to see your precious X-Men fight the bad guys and stuff like that. But all the great character moments stay with you forever. There's some more fun texturing in the carpeting. Or in the floor, rather. I love this. The, the X-Men, how they really look, how they're supposed to look, and how Jean sees them. And apparently she's in some sort of... Uh, old fantasy going on and that's what Jason Wingard looks like but that's what he really looks like how creepy is that and Jean was making out with him yuck <clears throat> and here comes Wolverine and he's pissed I love that this is so action-packed I and mean, this is like some real John Byrne greatness so here goes Cyclops uh blasting Harry Leland through the door and like but you get, like, that's upstairs and just, I don't know. How does Byrne do it? How does he come up with such great choreography for his 
fight scenes. That's a great panel there too. And of course, Mastermind's gonna slip it, slip away like a coward, I guess. There's the beast, the blue furred beast. I don't know what the beast looks like these days. I can't keep up, but this is my favorite version of the beast. This is the beast I know and love. That's so cool. She looks so menacing there and there. Great page. And I love that she's so ruthless. She just like pins him up against the wall with her phoenix claw. Shatters his, is that an image inducer? Or my mind trap mechanism. And then she's going deep into his mind and bam, she turns him into a crazy pile of mush. And that's it. So I guess, you know, they're free of Mastermind's control. They're escaping. Everything's cool, except for the fact that, boom, now I'm Dark Phoenix. Oh, crap. I mean, I know you guys are exhausted. You've been being held hostage for days or something, but um, now you have to fight me, Dark Phoenix, your own teammate. Such a great shot there. This is such an iconic cover there. I always love when they're doing something to the title um, or working the art into the title. Once again, I say it all the time, but a perfect example of the storytelling powers and tools that you have in comic books that make them so great. And this makes me wonder, I'm sure, I wonder if this is just Auburn and Austin. I would think so. I don't know why they, I don't think they would need the letter to do that. This is such a great shot there. Phoenix looks so powerful. Everyone just falling to the earth. Man, this is so cool. I mean, the pacing of this, they just got over fighting the, the Hellfire Club. And you would think that that would be enough for an arc unto itself, but it's just a part of the greater arc going on. All these iconic shots here are just so amazing. And that was the back cover of the, is it this one too? No, it's not but of the Bill Sienkiewicz trade paperback, the cover, the one with the Bill Sienkiewicz cover, has that as the back cover. It's funny with the white paper, the color and it looks so bright. I love how Phoenix just transmuted this tree into gold. They're like, quick, grab the gold, we can buy another blackbird. This is cool. I, they used this image for a, a t-shirt and I had that t-shirt. I want to say, though, that they colored it, she was green and not red, but I could be wrong about that. <laughs> well, see, once again, I always point out, but, you know, the fun of being in the Marvel Universe is when the other books sort of creep in and have little crossovers. Um, I love the thing with this bathrobe on and, uh, like, soap suds and is non-existent here. It's the Avengers Quinjet. I think that's John Burns' design, or it could be George Perez's design, but someone someone might know. Leave in the comments if you know who designed the Avengers Quinjet, because I know it was either Burn or Perez, although they probably both had their own version. Nobody draws cosmic space better than Burn and Austin together. Their stuff on Star Lord looks so cool, and this is a little reminiscent of that. I love all the stippling that Austin works into the inks. I mean, this. How long must have this have, have taken? You know, today we hate, all you have to do is drop in the blacks with the fill bucket, with the Photoshop and all that stuff. But this is all like done. What normally would probably happen is this was all painted in black and then you come in with the white ink and do all the stars over it. But that is like a lot of work right there. Terry Austin definitely was is such a master of his craft, and I just love his ink so much, especially on Burn. I mean, one of the greatest art, comic art teams in history, like undeniably. I know that some people, I actually think I saw someone say that they did not like John Burns art once and they were immediately sapped off the planet for speaking such bl <laughs> blasphemy. <clears throat> Uh, 
There's Jean coming home to visit her cranky parents. Her parents were kind of buttholes. I don't, I, I don't get it. They always seemed a little uh, put off by the whole thing. So, you know, you go home to visit your family and the X-Men attack you. I mean, I get it. You probably don't want me to come home that often. <laughs> so many great shots here. I love that uh, Beast made this headband to sort of inhibit her powers, but she is way too powerful for that, so forget it. I mean, come on, she's just got them like puppets on a string there. This has to be a, a John Burnism. What is she doing? What is she doing to uh, Colossus here? It's like the scene in uh, Avengers West Coast when uh, Scarlet Witch uh, did something to Wonder Man's shuttles, but off camera, thank God. Um, he just really does draw pretty women. This is some great shot here. This is poor Xavier blasted out of his wheelchair and fighting head to toe with the Phoenix Force. And we think she's gone. Is she gone? Well, um, you know, just when you think she's gone, the battle's done. Blam! Now she's got to atone for her sins. We're going to get abducted. Here comes the Watcher. Love the Watcher. Anytime the Watcher's there, you know something big's going to happen. This is the big double. Could you imagine how awful? <laughs> Like, this is, like, one of the most important issues in comic book history. Such a great, iconic cover. And then it has this stupid, this Marvel comic could be worth $2,500 to you. And it could be worth uh, five times as much without that stupid banner on it. Hey, guys. This is such a great double-page spread here. Even though we lose Storm's face in the trade paperback, she gets sucked into the gutter. But trust me, this is a great shot. If you guys have the artist edition that's included in there and it's all its actual size black and white glory um so john Byrne um said that this is one of uh an issue that just hit all the beats for him and came out pretty much exactly how he wanted to to which is kind of interesting because i think they changed the end so i mean it can't be that. You get Colossus and his tidy whities so it can't be a bad day when that happens. Oh, this is so funny because uh, are you guys reading uh, X-Men Elsewhen, John Burns fanfics? This, there's a page that looks very much like this. I think I want to say it's like page one of the first issue, but I could be wrong about that. But if you want to check it out, you should go to Burn Robotics under the fan fiction. And there's a bunch of free X-Men comics, all new, all gorgeous, glorious John Burner. that if you're missing it, get on it. I always like this character, Hussa, because first of all, it sounds like Hussy. And second of all, oh, Hussar, I'm sorry. That's right. But um, she's like got a skullet. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing sexier than a woman with a skullet, cloven hooves, and hair coming out of the back of her ankles. Storm is so cool. It's Wolverine lost inside the Watcher's uh, house. Coming to my house. <laughs> Uh-oh, I know the same storm because I'm Wolverine and you can't fool me because you smell like a scroll. <laughs> I love a, a new Superman, I mean Gladiator. I love when Gladiator appears because it gives John Byrne an excuse to do all his Superman poses. And really, what is Gladiator but a purple Superman with a mohawk? So things are not going well. The fight for the fate of Jean Grey. And then here comes, she tells Peter to punch her and pow, or no, maybe he just does it anyway because Phoenix is creeping back in. And you know, it ain't long for the world if the Phoenix is coming. Apparently she started the whole damn universe now, now that we're 
we've completely run out of ideas, so we're just gonna attach Phoenix to everything. And that's the heartbreaking shot, where Phoenix sacrifices herself with this conveniently hidden watcher gun waiting in the midst. And he's like, that's right, it's over, she's dead. Anyway, so that was the Dark Phoenix Saga, one of the most important, best, fantastic comic books in comic book history. Oh, there's the cover for the trade paperback that I have. Love that shot. Especially since it has Kitty in her green Ariel costume that didn't really take off ever. I'm sure this has been reprinted a million and ten times, as it always should be. Oh, there's a great... I love to see the black and white art. I love that when you get to see like the liner notes and notes to the colorist and all the care that the they put in. I mean, they put so much into making these books, you know, then to turn around and sell it for what, 40 cents or whatever it was back in the day. Oh, to see this art in person. Anyway, ah, what, <laughs> what is that? Oh my God, there's a huge UPC sticker over Jean's head. I'm not going to take it off on camera now because then I'll be nervous and rip it. But anyway, that's the Dark Phoenix saga. You know it. You love it. You need to bust it out of your long box and read it again. Uh, so hit subscribe, please. Like. I super appreciate it. And I'll bring you some more later. All right. Thanks, guys.